All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now back. Hopefully we all have the paper in front of us. Um, I see it has been shared on the chat group as well. All right, so the aim of what we're doing now is, look, we've now looked at how to draft an L&D account. So now what we are trying to do is have a look at the way questions could be asked, and we need to do determine where would we place certain things right so what i want us to do is to make our notes we would place different assets and different liabilities um you know find your own way to be able to write things in a certain manner i mean if we're saying we're putting it in the liquidation account maybe we can call it l if we're putting it in the state duty account we call it ed you know so maybe find your own way to make your notes so that you don't fall behind when we are done going through it um, I will open the floor up to questions again, where you'll be able to ask me about certain things. So let's go through the paper. So right on top there, I'm giving you a bit of a background to the matter. It's saying X is married in community of property to Y. X dies with a valid will. So straight away, we know there's a marriage and community of property. So this is obviously going to affect our estate duty. Uh, it's going to affect our distribution account. You know, because we're going to be having to, we're going to have to give half away to our spouse. Uh, just make sure we are all muted, ladies and gents. I see some of us are not muted. Uh, D E D. I'm not too sure. Uh, you are not muted. All right. X dies with a valid will. So we know we're dealing with test state, test state law over here. X leaves his entire estate to his two children, A and B. So what is he saying there? A and B are the heirs of the estate. X bequeaths 20,000 rand to a children's fund. So he is giving something or she is giving something specifically to a children's fund. So it means that children's fund is a legacy. But we also know that that children's fund might have a home in our estate duty as well. Okay. So from the top of the question, we have a will, we have a marriage and community property. We've identified the two heirs, A and B, and we have identified the legacy as the children's fund. So let's think about our liquidation account first. So if we're in our liquidation account and we start off with our assets and e-movable property as such. We have Earth 123 valued at 2 million. So we know Earth 123 comes under immovable property under our liquidation account. We already know how to draft it. I mean, look at the example we have in our notes. Okay, so we make our notes that Earth 123, the 2 million, comes as an asset under immovable property. From what I can see, that is the only immovable property that we have. So after immovables, we said we have to look at movable property. So let's have a look through our assets, what movables we see here. We see a vehicle at 100,000 Rand. That's going to be our first movable. Keep in mind that our Earth 1, 2, 3 and our vehicle we would have awarded, hey, because they did not say we sold it. We then have coins that are realized for 30,000 Rand. So coins would also fall under movables. But we do not need to award it. We say realize. Eh? Realize means we sold those coins for 30,000 Rand. Then we have ABC Company, shareholding approved by Chief Revenue Inspector. So over here, they did not tell us if it is a private or public company, but they did say shareholding approved by Chief Revenue Inspector. Now, if you recall, that is the way we described private companies. So straight away, we should know we are now dealing with a private company. It says the value of it is 500,000 Rand, but it is sold for 800,000 Rand. Ladies and gentlemen, this ABC company is a PTY LTD. It's a private company. It's going to come under movables in our liquidation account. And the figure we're going to use here is always the sold for figure. So we'll be using the 800,000 Rand figure. And it's going to be realized. Hey, anything sold is realized. So, so far we have three movables. We have the Mazda, we have the coin, 
Chains and we have the ABC company, the PTY Limited. If we look at our next asset, we'll see a Liberty Investment and then we see a UT number. Now, that's not something we've discussed before. UT stands for Unit Trust. This is also falling under movables. So we'll just have our unit trust there for an amount of 10,000 Rand under our movables by assets. And we apply the same principle we apply to companies with unit trusts. It doesn't say we've sold these units. It just says we have these units. So we'll have to award these unit trusts under the Liberty Investment. The next one I see there is an F&B savings account. Now, I know that it's a bank account, so that's going to be a claim in favor. So the right thing to do is to just look further to see if we have any other movables before we start with the bank account. There is one other movable there. It's the very next one, the comic collection. A comic collection would fall under movable assets. You will see the interesting here. They say the value at date of death is 50,000 but realized 60,000. So we sold this comic collection for 60,000 Rand. Again, ladies and gents, we apply the same principle. We use the sold for figure, we use the realized figure. So comic collection falls under movables and it is realized for 60,000 Rand. We are not interested in the value of 50,000 Rand because we use the sold for figure. But then they also give us a commission over there. Commission of 5,000 Rand. Now. I want us to keep in mind, commission is money you pay someone for selling something, okay? So obviously, we paid someone 5,000 Rand for selling the comic collection for us. Now, it would imply that we owe five, the deceased estate owes 5,000 Rand. So we know we can make our mark already that that commission falls under liabilities. So we're not going to touch it just yet, but commission means we owe someone 5,000 Rand. So we'll just leave it for now, but we'll come back to it. As far as I can see, there's just bank accounts and policies left. So there is no other movable assets here. So I can then switch now to claims in favor, my third different type of asset, claims in favor. So above the comic collection, we had the FNB. Savings account. Okay. Balance at date of death 25,000, collected 28,000. Now, here's a different way of asking it. Usually they would say balance at date of death 25,000, and then let's say a month or two after the person died, they would have a different figure, which we know is income and expenditure. But I want us to apply our minds here. If you have 25,000 Rand in your bank account the day you die, you cannot collect 28,000 Rand because 25,000 Rand does not equal 28,000 Rand. You can't sell 25,000 Rand for 28,000 Rand. So obviously, we did not take that money out of the bank account uh, when the person passed away. That money was kept in there and somehow it increased by 3,000 Rand, perhaps interest, I would assume. So that 3,000 Rand uh, extra that we collected above and beyond the 25k must have happened after date of death. Remember what I said with bank accounts, look out for two different figures, a date of death figure and then possibly a different figure. So we also said when we deal with bank accounts in our liquidation account, we use the date of death figure, meaning under claims in favor, we will have our f &B savings account. And the amount we're going to use there is 25,000 Rand. We use the date of death figure for bank accounts. OK, make that note if you think you're going to forget it. So we'll have that 25K in our liquidation account. Then at the bottom, we have three policies. We have the Sunlum life policy. 550,000 Rand payable to Y. Now, if we go on top, we see Y is our spouse, eh? Because X is married in community of property to Y. Nevertheless, Y is a life policy that has a beneficiary, hey? Eh? Y is the beneficiary. So we know we leave it out of our liquidation account. So the Sunline life policy does not have a home in our liquidation account. We leave it alone.
because there is a named beneficiary. Let's go on to the next one. Momentum policy over the life of Y. So Yar is a life policy over the life of our spouse. Obviously, if they're bringing it over here, it means it's supposed to pay out to us, to the deceased person. But the deceased person has died first. And the key word over there, you see a surrender value of 600,000 rand. It then goes on to deal with 10,000 rand unpaid premiums on a policy that needs to be accounted for. So we still owe 10,000 rand. Now, the moment we owe 10,000 rand on premium, we think, okay, that's another liability. So we're going to leave it alone for now. But this momentum policy with a surrender value, we learned if we see surrender value, we put it in our liquidation account. So again, the momentum policy is going to come under claims in favor as there is a surrender value for the amount of 600,000 rand. There is one more policy over there, Liberty Life Policy of 200,000 rand, and it says no beneficiary. If we recall from yesterday, we learned if there's a life policy with no beneficiary, it comes into our liquidation account. So we'll have to add our Liberty Life Policy into our liquidation account under claims in favor. So yeah, the key thing is look out for a surrender value, then it comes in our liquidation account. And if it's a life policy payable to someone else, look out if there is someone else. If there's a beneficiary, we don't touch it. Not in our liquidation account at least. But if there's no beneficiary, we'll have to put it in because no beneficiary means it has to pay out into the deceased estate. All right. That is our assets. Obviously, we're going to add all of that together. We get our total assets. From there, we need to minus our liabilities. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see there is liabilities. But if we recall, we also had liabilities from our assets. So under liabilities, we know we start with our administrative expenses. So, sorry, yeah, Kyle? Gave it. Yes. Kyle, you're sounding absolutely perfectly, except you keep breaking intermittently. Um, sure. Uh, is it the same everywhere else? Yes, you keep breaking. Okay, l l let me do let me do what I did now. No, no, let me just quickly log off and log back on. Okay, uh, how do I sound now? Is it a bit better? Better. Perfect. Got better. For now. Okay. Good Much stuff. Much better. All right. So we are busy with our liabilities. We know liabilities are divided into two. Administrative expenses as well as creditors. So we start with our admin expenses. You can see they give it to us. They tell us the admin expenses is 400,000 rand. So all we do is we go and record the 400,000 Rand. Over here, they did not ask us to name it. They just told us to put it there. Okay, so that's easy enough. After you're done with admin expenses, we have to move on to creditors. So let's have a look. We owe F&B 420,000 Rand. So we're going to put F&B bond account 420,000 Rand as a liability, as a creditor. We owe Vodacom 2,000 Rand. So again, Vodacom is going to be a creditor. There is a standard bank credit card at date of death, 20,000 Rand is owing. Bank charges accrued thereafter in the amount of 400 Rand. Again, ladies and gentlemen, in the liquidation account, when it comes to bank accounts, we use the date of death figure. Those bank charges that came there after is going to be for our income and expenditure account. So you have your standard bank credit card under creditors. And you use the 20,000 Rand amount, the date of death. Oh, yeah. Kyle? Yeah. Kyle? Is there another connection issue? You're sounding muffled again. Yeah, the connection uh, is breaking up. Goodness. Um, all right. Uh, let me try again to go off and back on.
All right, ladies and gents, please just stop me if I if I sound muffled or it breaks up again. Um, all right. So we're dealing with this standard bank credit card. We said it, it is a creditor as it falls under liabilities. We owe 20,000 rand a date of death. Then there's bank charges that accrue thereafter. The key word being afterwards. So we know when it comes to bank accounts, we always use the date of death figure in our liquidation account. So the standard bank credit card will be a liability under creditors, and we're going to use the 20,000 rand figure, the date of death figure. Okay, so that's the only liabilities they put you. But remember what I said? Go back to your assets and see if there's any liabilities there. Now, we actually saw two liabilities under our assets. The first one is by the comic collection. There was that commission of 5,000 Rand. Now I'm gonna give you a tip quickly and then I'll explain it. If you see commission payable to someone, it is always an administrative expense. So commission is an admin expense. Now let me explain to you why. Admin expenses, were natural expenses it caused in winding up the deceased estate. So why do they interpret commission as an admin expense? The reason is because in the process of winding up this deceased estate, the executor sold the comic collection for 60,000 Rand and had to pay someone 5,000 Rand for doing it for him or her. So that selling of the comic collection occurred in the process of winding up the deceased estate. So when we had to pay that person 5,000 Rand, it was a natural expense incurred so that we could wind up the deceased estate. So if you see commission payable to someone, remember it falls under admin expenses under liabilities. All right, there was one other liability. We had the momentum policy. There was 10,000 Rand unpaid premiums that needs to be accounted for. So we owe Momentum 10,000 Rand on unpaid premiums. So Momentum will have a creditor claim against us. So those 10,000 unpaid premiums will fall under creditors by our liabilities. Can, can I ask a question? Um, I think, Matt, let, let's leave the questions for the end. Otherwise, we're not going to push through it. So keep your question in mind. Uh, what's your name? Sam. Is it there, Bandile and Lovu? It's Sam. Okay, you'll be the first one, okay. So let's push through it. Make your notes and make your stars by places where you think uh, you, you don't quite fully follow, don't quite fully understand. Um, I will give you an opportunity at the end to ask questions, but I want to just go through the account first with all of us. Okay. So now we're going to add all of this up, our admin expenses and our creditors up, and we're going to get our total liabilities. But we know our liquidation account consists of total assets minus total liabilities minus estate duty equals balance available for distribution. We now need to go and calculate our estate duty. So we move on to our second account, the estate duty account. Now, if we remember the formula there, it was property plus deemed property minus allowable deductions minus the 4A rebate of three and a half million, gave us a dutable amount. 20% of that gave us estate duty. All right, so we start off with property. So property would be our total assets minus potentially two things. I mean, you're welcome to obviously open up your notes from now now if you think it would be easier. So under property, we put total assets. That will obviously be our total assets from our liquidation account. From there, we said we could either minus 30% of a farming undertaking or the difference in private company shares. Now, if we look at the question in front of us, we did not have a farm. So that falls away. But we did have a private company. We had that ABC company where the shares were valued at 500,000 Rand, but sold for 
800,000 Rand. Now remember the difference between what they were valued at and what they were sold for. As long as the sold for price is more than the value, the difference between the two we can subtract from our total assets. So you can see if it's valued at 500 but sold for 800, it means it was sold for 300,000 Rand more than what it was valued at. So that 300,000 Rand difference we can minus from our total assets under property. So the you'll have the ABC company shares. The difference in the value and the and the amount it sold for is three hundred thousand rand. That gets minus from our total assets. So our property under estate duty is our total assets minus this three hundred thousand rand difference in private company shares. Now we move on to the portion of plus deemed property. Plus deemed property now i think we spoke and we said you know things to look out for for deemed property is things like donations or accrual or life policies over the life of the deceased where there was a named beneficiary now we don't have any accrual yeah we don't have any donations here but we did have that sunlum life policy that sunlum life policy was five hundred and fifty thousand rand that was payable to y so there is a life policy with a named beneficiary. If you recall, we did not include the standalone life policy in our liquidation account. However, it has a home under deemed property in a state duty. So we had to plus that standalone life policy of 550,000 Rand under deemed property. Sorry, Kyle. Uh, does the 20,000 to a children's fund not amount to a donation? No, it, it must say donation. That 20,000 children's fund will be a legatee. The okay, word donation on what you do. Okay. So that's the only deemed property we have here. So we move on to the next portion of a state duty, which was minus, or let me rather use the words less, section four allowable deductions. Now, you can look at your notes. You'll see various forms of allowable deductions that I gave you. If I have a look quickly on the notes, allowable deductions, I see things to look out for is liabilities, charitable bequests, life policies where um, uh, the spouse is the beneficiary, accrual, things like that. Okay. So if we have a look at our question, what allowable deduction do we see here? Well, first things first. We need to minus our liabilities now. Now that we get, that's our total liabilities from our liquidation account. So I minus the total liabilities from the liquidation account. Do I have any charitable bequests? Yes, I do. There's 20,000 Rand that is given to a children's fund. That is for a charitable cause. So that 20,000 Rand to the Children's Fund, I can also minus under allowable deductions. All right. The key thing, as I said, to also look out for is if there was a life policy that's payable to a beneficiary and that beneficiary happened to be your spouse, it is also an allowable deduction. So that's our life policy that was payable to Y. Y is our spouse. We plus it by deemed property, but we can also minus it by our allowable deductions. So what they are saying is, if you leave a life policy to your spouse, you won't be taxed on it because we plus it by deemed property and we minus it by allowable deductions. But let us say that some life policy was payable to A or B, one of those heirs, our children. We would have just plus it by deemed property we would not have been able to minus it by allowable deductions because A or B is not our surviving spouse. So there's something to think about when you do estate planning. Hey, If you want to leave a life policy behind, rather perhaps leave the life policy for your spouse and leave some assets for your children. Because if you leave life policies to your kids, your estate duty is going to go quite high, especially if your life policy is um, you know, millions of rands worth. OK, ladies and gents, there is also a 
marriage year. Now, remember the rule. The rule is anything that accrues to your surviving spouse as a result of your death is an allowable deduction. Now, as a result of the deceased person's death, half of the estate goes to Y because they were married in community of property. So Y's half share should also be deducted as an allowable deduction. Y's half share of the estate should also be deducted as an allowable deduction. I do not see any other allowable deductions here, ladies and gents. So that is your allowable deductions done and dusted. So now your, you know, your estate duty addendum reads property plus deemed property minus these allowable deductions minus section 4A primary rebate. That is always three and a half million. So from there we minus 3.5 million. That's going to give us a figure. That figure we call the dutable amount. 20% of that figure is our estate duty. All right, but you can refer to your notes when looking at, at that. I mean, the notes are quite clear. All right, next account we look at is a distribution account. Now we know we distribute, we take that balance. Well, sorry, before we even go there, that estate duty figure we got, remember we had to go place it back in our liquidation account, hey? Eh? So our liquidation account now reads assets minus liabilities minus estate duty is going to give us a balance available for distribution. That balance available for distribution in our liquidation account, we carry now forward into our distribution account. And we divide that in terms of marriage, legacies, and heirs. So when we divide it in terms of marriage, we'll have to give half to Y because there was a marriage in community of property. So Y would be entitled to half of that figure. Thereafter, we go to legacies. We had one legacy. Hey? It was the children's fund of 20,000 Rand. So we need... Hello? Sorry, I just got a question on, on the allocation to the wife. Is that the net or the gross? In other words, uh, if the total assets were 4 million, does the allocation to, to the wife be uh, equal 2 million or is it the net value asset less liabilities? The net value. All right, so remember, it's the balance available for distribution that we brought forward. So that balance available for distribution was assets minus liabilities minus estate duty. So it's the net value that your spouse is entitled to half of. Right, so we gave half of that to the spouse. Then we went to legacies. We had one legacy, the children's fund. 20,000 Rand had to go there. So we'll name the children's fund as a legacy and give 20,000 Rand away to the children's fund. After legacies, we have heirs, right? Who's our heirs? A and B are our heirs. So whatever is left, after we've sorted the spouse out, after we sorted the children's fund out, whatever is left, we will divide between A and B as our two heirs of this estate. So the heirs will be A and B because the question tells us. So. Right. You will then have a look at your recapitulation account. Right now, ladies and gents, um, I mean, obviously, we don't have the figures here with us. So we're not doing the calculation. We are just allocating things. But in our recapitulation account, we know we started off with cash assets and assets reduced to cash. So now we must go back to our liquidation account and count and have a look at what assets were realized or collected. Now, if I look at the question paper, the coins were realized. The shares in the ABC company was realized. The, um, the F&B savings account was collected. So, so far we have the coins, we have the ABC company, we have the F&B savings account. The comic collection was also realized, that's 60,000 Rand. And then the momentum policy 
was collected and the Liberty Life policy was also collected. So the coins, the ABC company, the FMB savings account, the Cobby collection, the momentum policy, and the Liberty Life policy was things in our liquidation account, assets in our liquidation account that was realized and collected. So I will add the value of all those realized and collected items and will give me my cash assets and assets reduced to cash. From there, we minus our total liabilities from our liquidation account, our estate duty that we calculated, as well as any cash legatees. Well, we have one cash legatee here. It was that 20,000 Rand uh, children's fund. So I will minus those three things from my cash assets and assets reduced to cash and see if I get a positive or a negative answer. If positive cash surplus, if negative cash shortfall. From there, I can move to my income and expenditure account. So we'll need to have a look if there was any income or expenditure off the date of death. With the income and expenditure account, I have particular interest in my bank accounts. So let us look. There was two bank accounts in this question that sort of came into play. By the assets, we had that F&B savings account. In our liquidation account, we put the 25,000, the date of death value, but we collected 28,000, meaning it grew 3,000 Rand off the date of death. So in my F, sorry, in my uh, income and expenditure account, under income, I would have to put that 3,000 Rand growth from my F&B savings account. From what I can see, that was the only income we made off the date of death was the 3,000 Rand from our F&B savings account. Thereafter, we moved to expenditure. Now, straight away, we had an income, so we had at least one expense. Executors fees. Executors entitled to 6% of that 3,000 Rand. Now, I, I think 6% of 3,000 is about 180 bucks that you'd be entitled to there. After I've sorted the executor out, I have a look to see if there was any other losses here. And there was, right at the bottom, that Standard Bank credit card. It said bank charges accrued thereafter in the amount of 400 Rand. So I'd have to add those bank charges from my Standard Bank credit card, that 400 bucks. I would have to add under my expenditure as well. Sorry, Kyle. Uh, is that comic comic collection not? Uh, it's valued at the date of debt at fifty thousand, and thereafter, you sold it for sixty. So doesn't it have the same application like the savings account where you had twenty five at the date of debt, and then you got twenty eight thereafter? No, not at all. That's where the rule comes in. Um, the rule says when you sell an asset, you always use the sold for price in your liquidation account. And, and the explanation is quite simple. Your income and expenditure account is not an asset and liability account. When you passed away, you had that comic collection as an asset already in your account. Hence, we use the sold for price. But when you passed away, you had 25,000 Rand in your bank account. I can't sell 25,000 for 28,000. That bank account money grew to 28,000 Rand. So it became income off the date of death. So the tip is when you sell something, use your sold for price in your liquidation account. But when you have money in a bank account and that money becomes less or more, then we start worrying about the income and expenditure account. Okay, thank right. you. Perfect. So now we go income minus expenditure. So we had the income of 3,000, and from there we minus the 180 executive fees and the 400 Rand bank charges. You know, it's about 580 bucks we minus from the 3,000. Now, 3,000 minus 580 is 2,420. Okay, not that you need to worry about the figures at this stage, but that is 2,420 Rand positive, hey, that we have. Again, we have not recorded this 2,420 Rand anywhere. 
This is totally different figures we haven't worked for worked with before. So we must now distribute this 2,420 Rand in the same way we did our distribution account. So we'll give half of it away. Are you breaking spouse. again? All right, let me just log off and log back on. Sorry, Carl, we can't hear anything. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. All right. So we had this 2,420 odd rand um, as a positive as after we minus our expenditure from our income. Now we said now, now that we'll need to distribute this money again. So we distributed in the exact same way we distributed our distribution account. We'll give half of it away to our spouse. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, we are only giving off to our spouse because there was a marriage in community of property. Who's next in line? The legatees. But remember what I said. We already sorted our legatees in our distribution account. That 20,000 ran to the children's fund that we had to give. We have already done it. So I can't give more to my legatees. Hi. So whatever is left will go to alone. There seems to be a connection problem on your side. It's muffled and it keeps um, breaking up. So I, I really don't know what to do at this stage. I'll go off again and try to go back on. Last time when you just muted your mic and you unmuted it, it worked perfectly again. All right, uh, hopefully it's better now, but please tell me again if it's not better, um, if you can't hear me. All right, so in our income and expenditure account, we then distributed that remaining money that was left in terms of the ranking of spouse, legatees, and heirs. But we've already sorted the legacy out of the distribution account. So we gave the 20,000 there. So we'll give half away to the spouse, and then whatever is left to the heirs being A and B. So we'll finish with a null balance again. Oh. Uh, yes. What about the executor the executor's fee? What about the are you talking in the liquidation account? No, in the income, uh, in the income expense account. Yes, that was the very first uh, expenditure we had. We said the executor's fees. 6% of the, the 3,000 income is uh, the very first expenditure we had. Oh, is, oh, you've taken care of it. Okay, I think I might Correct. have that. Okay. That's it. That's it. Okay. We've taken care of it. So, I mean, ladies and gents, uh, look, the, the distribution, the recapitulation account, and the income and expenditure account, you know, you can look at your notes and we'll cover it. For me, the biggest part of doing what I'm doing now was that we can look at the type of questions and just confirm with ourselves, you know, that came in the liquidation account, that came in the estate duty account. We used that figure, we didn't use that figure. That's the sort of type of basic exercise I'm trying to do with all of you over here. I mean, I'm not asking you to drop this in the L and D because you have an example of how it looks. So we're just trying to learn how to apply a question to our L and D account. All right. Let's right. open the floor okay. for questions. Uh, before okay. before I start the question, there was Gloria. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on, Fatima. hold on, hold on. There was a lady right at the beginning that wanted to ask me a question. I think it was a lady. It could have been a gentleman. Right at the beginning, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Go for it. Oh, madam, it's me, Sam. Stop lying now. That was what you, madam. <laughs> I think it was the Bandile. Hi. Bandile. Yes. Hi. Good Go for it, Bandile. It's Rulani, yeah. Rulani will be with you now, now, no, ma'am. Uh, let's do Bandile first. Kyle, before I go on, you are still having the problem with your network. Try to mute and unmute. Let's hear.
Um, sure. I, I don't yeah. know. Even if it sounds yeah, better now, better. it'll probably go bad again now. No. <laughs> that's much better. Okay, go for it. Okay. I've got one question in the issue of um, the momentum policy. Yeah. Obviously, Kyle, if a company needs to pay into you and they realize that there's money that is owing to the company, they will never pay the full price. So why do we have to allocate the surrender value while there's unpaid premiums that definitely the company will never release and actually go account to it? Isn't it like doing a bit of something that it's already going to be taken care of when we receive the money, we'll receive it deducted already? Yes. Adile, you know, the thing is, I agree with you 100%. In, um, in, uh, in reality, they, they would sort out those premiums as such uh, before they even do so. However, there is occasions where it has not been done and in the past that I've picked up and I have seen exam questions that lean towards unpaid premiums on the policy as well but I would assume in reality majority of the time that wouldn't be an issue because the company would have sorted those premiums out before they released the money. So will I be penalized in, in, in exams purposes because if you account for it and say you minus it already in your LMD and say the surrender value was 590 because that's what they will pay and it makes no. A good accountability on my side. No. So, so Bandil, I'm glad you brought that up because there's maybe something I can clarify. You never, ever minus things from your assets and just put down that figure. What we do in our L&D account is we call it full disclosure. You put the full value of the asset and the full value of the liability. So under assets, you would have put the full 600,000 rand. And under liabilities, the full 10,000 rand. You can't minus a liability from an asset and record that figure down under assets. Rather put the full value of the asset and then the, the 10,000 rand unpaid premiums will come under liabilities. Okay, understood. The second question I have is when you are on estate duty, the half share of the spouse, is it the gross asset or the gross amount or, or, or the net value? Okay, good, good question. All right. So, so under estate duty, you know, you'll find it in your notes. I mean, there's a lot of things I don't say because it's easy to read from your notes, but I can bring it up right now. When, when we calculate our spouse's half share under estate duty, the calculation is property minus liabilities. Okay. Property minus liabilities. Now, Property refers to your property figure right above you on top of estate duty. If you recall, if you recall, um, yes, I'm with you. If you recall under on under on, on estate duty, your property was your total assets, and I think we minus the difference in private company shares from it. Yes. So that figure that you get there, minus liabilities from your liquidation account, is going to give you your spouse's is going to give you an answer. And then you divide that in two, and then you get your spouse's half share. So property minus liabilities gives you an answer. Divide that by two, and then you get your spouse's half share. Okay, Kyle, if I'm hearing you well, you are saying the half share of the spouse will actually be the total asset, less if there are any private shares or... What else is there? Or farming undertaking. Or farming undertaking, yes. Or farming undertaking, less your liabilities, then you calculate. Basically, we will say it's less your liabilities. Yes. That's when you can take out the half. And that's your spouse's half share. But keep in mind that is only for estate duty purposes. That's not what's going to happen in your distribution account. Yes, yeah, that's no, only I'm for calculation of estate duty. On, yeah. Sorry. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm just on the estate duty account because I, I. I'm not sure if this half share actually it's at which point after which figure exactly. Okay, but you have it now. 
Do we still have to minus? Um, okay, never mind. I will figure it out. Okay, it's fine. But, but Dile, so, if you listen to me, listen to me quickly because I, I think you're missing something. Under allowable deductions, we were able to minus our spouse's half share if we were married in community of property. So the question is, how do I get my spouse's half share? And I've given you the formula. The formula is property minus liabilities. It's going to give you an answer. Divide that answer by two, and that's your spouse's half share. Sorry to come in there, Kyle. Will that be property plus the deemed property? No, just property. I know. So it's just property. Go for it. Um, uh, Kyle, I just have one question here. Not that uh, I don't want to work, but the question uh, that we were doing says a draft the liquidation and distribution account. Why do we go ahead and do now the the receipt, what, what is re recapulation and uh, recapulation. <laughs> yeah, why do we do those? So, so a liquidation and distribution account is five different accounts, at least. Yeah. So if you see li draft liquidation and distribution account, it means draft everything. Uh, okay. Right. So we call, wouldn't say, so, wouldn't so say we, uh, draft uh, liquidation and, and, um, and distribution. Uh, 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 I mean, it's, the question, it, it wouldn't say put all the, the accounts. It would just say distribution and, and uh, liquidation and distribution only. Yeah, so, so if it says draft the liquidation distribution account, it means draft everything we've just drafted. You know, possibly the question could say only draft the following accounts and then it'll name the accounts they want you to draft. But th that's a pointless question. Usually the question is just draft the LND account, which involves all of these accounts. Okay, thanks. Karabo. Okay, I heard Karabo. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kyle, I just needed clarity ne? on on the policies. Ne? I can you please uh, clarify for me which policy do we leave if it has a beneficiary name on it? Is it a life policy or just a policy? It's life policies we're dealing with. Okay, so if there's a life policy with a name on, with a beneficiary on it, then we don't touch that. Is that what you're saying? Correct, correct. Okay, so, but if it's a policy and it has a name on it, we, we deal with it. <laughs> well, you know, that would depend on the type of policy. You know, it's, it's very, you know, I'm scared to just uh, characterize everything under one thing. You know, so you'd have to look at the type of policy but the idea is any mm -hmm. policy that you have that gets mm -hmm. paid to a beneficiary yes. cannot come into the deceased estate. Yes. Okay, because what, 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 what was confusing me here is that the, the, moment, the, the momentum policy, ne? on a momentum policy, there's a surrender value and then there's the premiums that, the premiums that were not paid. But we dealt with that and this policy has to be paid over to Y. Do you get me? Um, the the momentum policy. Yes, it's over wise life, which is the wife. And there's a surrender value and there is that amount. So I don't know if this are here to confuse us or are we meant to deal with them? Yeah, so so it is it is put in a confusing fashion because they haven't properly sort of explained what's happening here. But uh, but the fact that they mention a surrender value. Yes. tells us that they want us to make use of that figure in our um, in our liquidation account. Okay, even though it has a beneficiary on it? No, no, it doesn't give a beneficiary. It says the policy is over the life of Y. It doesn't say it's payable to Y. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, now yeah. I get it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so All much. Right. Okay. Hey, Rulani, yeah. Go for it. I heard you. Um, I wanted to check with regard to uh, ABC company. Uh, the, 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 the commission or the, the profit that it, it has been made year 300k, it forms part of the admin expenses. Um, no, 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 no. The ABC company, 
That was valued at 500,000 Rand but sold for 800,000 Rand. That did not form part of admin expenses. What formed part of admin expenses was the commission of 5,000 Rand under the comic collection. So what does this 300K go? Okay, so you can see, well, first of all, let's start here. That ABC company fell under a liquidation account and we used the sold for figure, right, of 800,000 Rand. Mm -hmm. But then we also used it under estate duty because under estate duty, it said property. Property was total assets minus potentially your difference in private company shares. Okay. Now, difference in private company shares implies that you will not be taxed if you own shares in a private company and those shares were sold for more than what they were valued at. So the difference between what it was sold for compared to what it was valued at, we won't be taxed on. So it was sold for 800,000 Rand, but valued at 500. So that 300,000 Rand difference, we can minus um, under property, under estate duty. Yeah, okay. Right. Gloria. And, and before I get to you, Gloria, just to mention, uh, um, Rolani, that's something that's very important, you know. I don't know what's coming forward, but that's a typical type of scenario that comes up in exams. So we must make sure we fully understand private companies, eh? Hey? Uh, make sure that you, you remember that it comes under in the liquidation account, but it also comes under estate duty. Right, Gloria? Um, Kyle, as we were talking, I was really trying to... Uh, Put everything down. I even have a paper with the columns and everything. That is very difficult to get everything all at once. Um, and I think this is the only really solid um, example that we've done on this um, liquidation and uh, expenditure or um, account. Can we please ask a favor of you, if you don't mind, please? That since you have already sent out the question, can you please uh, take time to maybe just do the account for us and post this so that we can use this as reference point because some of us are still trying to figure out which one goes away. Mm. If you don't mind, please. Yeah, please look, count, Gloria, please. look, two, two responses there. Number one, I don't mind. I just know a lot of times you're not allowed to hand memos out with lectures. So I'll just have to clarify that with Zukiswa. If, 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 uh, if I'm able to, I'll definitely send that. Um, let us go worst case scenario and I'm, and I'm unable to, then what would I suggest? I would simply suggest put the recording on when you study and then, uh, you know, pause it and play it and pause it and play it as we go along. Because the thing also is I'm trying to figure out if at the end we will have the total income and expenditure, you know, the total amounts correct, you know, just to use this as an example to even just prepare for the exam. Hmm. I'll, Someone I'll see what was I can asking do, about the 3,000 and so on and so forth, just to see which one goes where, so that we are on the right track. All right. I'll see what I can do for you. Thank you so much. All right. Aaron? Go for it. Hi, Kyle. For um, all of us. Exactly. Kyle, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, I'm listening. Oh, sorry. Um, in your recap account, let's say you have a cash shortfall and you have to sell one of the assets, will that then come into your income account? So in our recapitulation account, if we have yes. a cash thought form, no, yes. it won't. No, it won't. No. Because so, remember, your, your income and expenditure has nothing to do with your assets or liabilities. It refers to making money, money being made into more money after date of death. So if we had to sell an asset, Keep in mind, we had that asset the day we died. So it won't yes. have a home under the income and expenditure account. Okay, thank you. Yeah, perfect. So are you ready? Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Sure. I, um, I heard a gentleman and then I heard a lady. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, Kyle's ready. All right, yes, go for it. Sorry to bother you. Carl, actually, um, I understand that accounts basically what uh, you like it comes to your distribution and, uh, and liquidation account and so forth. I'm having a hustle actually getting the state duty to, to work out the state duty. I understand you mentioned actually your your uh, assets, actually basically your or your deemed property, 
you press that and you minus your X4 and X, X4 2, whatever. I just can't be able, to, I'm not be able to actually to picturize it actually or just point it out to the amount. I don't okay. know if I'm making sense. No, no, I get you. So, so what? remember we had our property, okay? And then from that figure, we plus our deemed property. Then from there, we minus allowable deductions. From there, we minus three and a half million primary rebate. And that's going to give us an answer. That answer is dutable amount. Now, if, if we think practically about it, that answer could be positive or negative. I mean, if it's negative, we just refer to it as zero. No, because you can't get a negative in tax, an estate duty. But whatever that answer was, 20% of that figure is estate duty. So if you had a look at your, on the notes, if you had a look at your estate duty account that I randomly did, um, just opening it quickly. If you look by property, you'll see underneath property, I drew two lines. That is what I'm going to record what my property is worth. Then I said plus deem property. I record what my deem property is worth. Then I said minus allowable deductions. And then I record what my allowable deductions is worth. So I have property plus deem property minus the section four allowable deductions minus three and a half million is going to give us an answer. 20% of that answer is the estate duty we have to pay. Um, I don't know if that helps, Roddy. Yeah, no, it does help. Thank you very much, Carl. It did like I was a bit confused with the line. Okay, now I just realized because I dropped uh, prior to the, to the break, I dropped the three lines. So I'm, I actually messed up on the allocation of the line. There. Thanks. Okay, perfect. I'm glad. All right. There was a lady that was next after Roddy. I just didn't catch the name. And it's Rizan. Okay, Razan, go for it. Okay, um, the commission made on the comic collection, the 5,000 Rand, is that 5,000 Rand included in the administrative costs? All right, good question. So from interpreting this question, they have told us our admin costs or admin expenses 400,000 Rand. That's the total amount. So we'll have to assume that that commission is already included. But you would have to interpret your exam question. I mean, they do it in different ways. Um, sometimes they give you certain admin expenses and say whatever all, whatever other admin expenses you, you come across, you must add it, in other words. So from this question, I would say it is definitely included, um, but in the exam, it doesn't mean it's going to definitely be included. We'll have to just see what way they sort of structure the questioning. Okay, thank you. Good stuff. Gideon. Gideon, I'm listening. Thank you, Carl. Uh, I'm a bit confused now. Um, in the income and expenditure account, uh, the, the 6% that goes to the executor, is that the only uh, money that he gets from winding up this estate or is uh, the 3,5 also still to be added? Thank yes. You. So, so in the liquidation account, we gave the executor under admin expenses, 3,5% of the total assets. Um, the 6% from the income and expenditure is an added incentive. If you can bring any money in after date of death, you can get 6% for that as well. So there's potentially two different places that you as executor can make your money from. Thank you. It makes it much uh, clearer now. Thanks. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hi, Namsa. Namsa, I'm listening. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, just remind me, under estate duty, what did you say forms part of the property looking at this example? So I'm property is work it out, but I'm like, I'm all over. I'm so, so intimidated, sorry. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Um, so property is your total assets that we get from the um, liquidation account, okay? But what they are saying is we could potentially minus two things from our property, either 30% of a farming undertaking, but in this example, we didn't have a farm, or the difference in private company shares, where shares in a private company were sold for more than what it was valued at. So we minus potentially those two things from our total assets, and that gives us our property value.
Okay, we had shares. Okay, maybe I'm just confused. Yes, Sorry. carry on, carry on. We had shares. Yes, you're on the right yeah. track. Sure. That's why I'm struggling with the three the three hundred thousand that the lady referred to. The five hundred difference between five hundred and eight hundred. So I thought it was going to be posted here. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. They, they, I'll read it into the next. It's fine. It is yeah, going so to be here. Under estate duty, under yes. property. Yes, yes, that difference is going to be there. You're 100% oh, correct. Okay, then I've got it. Thanks. Perfect. Misty? Misty, I'm listening. Hi, Kyle. So I have two questions. The first one is regarding the income and expenditure, expenditure account. When we get that final amount, where else do we need to note the distribution of it? Is it just in that account or do we go back to our distribution account and put anything there? Uh, no, so it's just in that account um, because it's, it's it's separate from your other four accounts. So you okay. just noted in that account, yes. Okay, great. And then the second question is in regard to something you said earlier about full disclo disclosure of assets and liabilities in the liquidation account. So that's the practice, the best practice that people use. How does that apply to the concept of co-ownership? This is something I asked yesterday. So I know if a property is co-owned, but the people who own it aren't married, they just, they share 50-50 in a house, for example, we only put half the value in your asset column, because that's the, the part that belongs to the deceased. But in the interest of full disclosure, how are you then fully disclosing that the property does The liability. Have, yeah. The, the, yeah. So then the liability, you'd have to also determine, are you only half liable for that liability? Because if you're half liable for it, then you'll only disclose half of it. You know, so when I say full disclosure, mm -hmm. I refer to full disclosure of assets and liabilities of the deceased person. Not yes. of others, you know, so, so you would treat that the same way you treated that home. Right. So if let's say, for example, you have a home and the home is worth five million um, rand and it's co-owned and then you have a liability that's also worth five million and that's split between two people, you would yes. put uh, 2.5 million under assets for the immovable property and then you would put 2.5 million under the liabilities for the co-loan. 100% correct. OK, great. Thank you so much. Good stuff. Carl, Riandi here. Go for it. Um, I have a question relating to the previous gentleman's question about the 3.5% of the executor's fees. And if that falls in our um, income or assets and liabilities account, even if the question doesn't necessarily say that, like in the example we just worked through um, with the uh, administrative expenses, would the executor's fee always be in there? And would we always have to put it in there? Or where does it go? I'm just jumbled on that currently. Okay. So, so the executor's fee falls under administrative expenses. Okay. So whether you have to put it in, in the exam depends on the question. I mean, the exam will tell you if they want you to add it to admin expenses. Or it will tell you if it's already included in admin expenses. So you'll have to um, interpret what the question is saying. But th they like to perhaps give you administrative expenses and then say, calculate the executor's fees and add it to the admin expenses, you know? So it depends on what the question is, is, is asking of you. Oh, okay. Um, okay, thank you so Coconono, much. Coconono, Kai? It's Coconono. Okay, go for it. Yes. Um, Kai, there was a question earlier on, I think it uh, it dealt with um, a balance, um, what is due to, to the spouse. And then I think it went as far as saying, um, we don't include deemed property. Own property. Uh, but, you know, I'm trying to look at the notes here and everything works out including deemed property. Yes, that, that is to calculate your estate duty answer. But we, yes. we're not, yes. yes. But when we deal with the spouse's half share, it's a separate calculation that we need to put in there. So the spouse's half share doesn't work of deemed property. Oh, so the spouse's half share doesn't work of the deemed property. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Oh. And, and also just keep in mind um, that uh, in estate duty, in all those calculations we are doing, 
we are actually not giving anything to anyone. The whole, whole aim exactly. of estate duty is, is to follow the formula so we can just get that final answer at the end of what, what tax, what estate duty we owe. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the right, only place, yeah, yeah. And I say this for everyone. The only place where we are literally giving things to people is our, obviously our liabilities and our estate duty we have to pay. But the distribution account then shows, is the only account, other account that shows who gets what. The, the other accounts too, the recap account, the estate duty account, those things, that's just calculation accounts. We're not physically giving things away. I, I hope that sort of makes sense. Okay, okay, clear, clear. Good stuff. So any other questions? Misty. Misty, I'm listening. Hi, Kyle. Sorry, this is just um, based on what someone said earlier about the executor's fees. Just to clarify, if in the question it doesn't mention executor's fees at all, so they haven't alluded to it in the admin um, expenses or anything like that, then would we just assume that we need to calculate it based off of the gross assets and include it anyway? Yes, yes, most definitely. And most does that also go for master's fees as well? Correct. Perfect, thank you. Hi, Kyle, it's Hepan here. Hi, yes. Um, this is just a follow-up. Um, uh, under the estate uh, duty account, under property, total assets, um, about the shares, company shares, um, on the total, do we write the amount the company sold for or the value of the company? Okay, so so let's keep in mind, what is total assets? Where do I get that from? I get that from my liquidation account. So if you recall in your liquidation account, you would have put the sold for price for the company. So you would have put the 800,000 Rand in your liquidation account. So that 800,000 Rand, already forms part of your total assets. So what are they actually saying to you? We'll give you a rebate of your total assets of 300,000 Rand because those shares that form part of your total assets were sold for 300,000 Rand more than what they were valued at. Oh. Does, that, does that make sense? Uh, it does, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Jonathan? Yeah. Jonathan? Uh, Kyle, uh, this is an admin question. Uh, in your opinion, how long do you think we should allocate to this question in the exam? Okay. Well, look, how long is the exam? This is the next question. You know, um, let's say uh, from what I've seen previously, exam. yeah, so let's say it's a, a, um, an hour and 45 minute exam or whatever the case may be. I would assume that you would usually need about an hour to do your L&D account. Um, from, from my opinion, how I would do it is I would first, I would leave this for last. So I would do the other questions because, you know, history tells me that the other things are much easier than the L&D account uh, for the students. So I would do the other things and then leave the L&D for last. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't allocate less than an hour uh, for doing the L&D accounts. Okay, thank you. All right. Zara? I'm listening. All right, if you have a maintenance claim in the question, will that go under liabilities in the liquidation account as a separate heading? Okay, great question. Yes. Any maintenance claim to the deceased estate falls under creditors under liabilities. So your maintenance claim to the deceased estate is ranked above your heirs, legacies, and spouse because it is regarded as a liability in your liquidation account. So it's considered a creditor? Correct. All right, and um, for your admin expenses, and say you have those specific expenses you have to list, do you list it in your calculation column or your liabilities column? So look, the admin expenses, I would list in my calculation column and put the total in my liability column. Okay, and um, in the again in the liquidation account, when you after every asset you say award to, are you just saying the person's name? Who's it going to? Or are you saying do you have to calculate specific amounts there, or are you just saying name? 
So, sorry, I missed that question. It just broke up. Can, can you say again? For the in in the liquidation account at the end of each uh, asset, you say award to. Um, there, are you just putting the person's name, or according to the question, or are you supposed to put an amount there? No. Okay. okay. So you can put you can put in the person's name according to the question, but remember, whenever you mention a person. Um, you put their name according to the question, but make up an ID number for me as well. So it's just their, their details. It's not any amount. No, no. So let's say, let's say it is, let's take this question, for example. Okay. So there was uh, a marriage and community of property to Y, and then there was two um, heirs, A and B. So you would have said half to Y because of the marriage and community of property and the residue. To A and B because they are the heirs. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Sorted. Perfect. Hi, Kyle. Hi, sorry. I, I see someone's trying to speak, but it, it's quite soft. Hi, Kyle. It's Nikita. Can you hear me? Nikita, I can hear you, but it's very, very soft. Is this a bit better? That's night and day difference. OK, cool beans. Um, so I don't know whether I'm jumping the gun here, but I just like to ask uh, based on some of the examples I went through uh, about the certificate that goes at the end, um, mm. which is basically, you know, either undersigned with the executor <laughs> and all of that. Uh, is that necessary for us to put in there or do we just do the l and account as is because most of the the previous question papers I went through have the certificate at the end and it counts for between three to five marks. OK, well, that's interesting because the certificate and the exams I've seen uh, hasn't been requested, but I'm sure there has been obviously as well. Now, usually what, what I what I would advise is. If you have time left in the exam, you add your executive certificate at the end. Now, for those who are a bit unsure what I'm talking about, in law, when we hear the word certificate, it doesn't mean an actual certificate. It is just written confirmation of something. So an executive certificate is sort of like two sentences that basically just says that you certify that everything that you've mentioned in the l d reflects the true and accurate uh, figures. Um, so uh, if the question asks you to put that in, I mean, that's a giveaway three marks. So I highly doubt you would you would be asked to put that in because uh, there's literally two sentences you must study. But uh, let's say the question does not ask you to put the executive certificate in. What I would advise is if you are done and there's time left, just put it in. And my, my, my only thought process would be that, you know, maybe you short something somewhere and you know, because you went the extra mile, it might make it easier, you know, but uh, I, I don't know. Um, usually it doesn't form part of it, but uh, if they don't say anything about it and you have time, just put it in for safety. OK, great. Thank you so much. Can I just ask um, one more thing? Uh, can you just please um, expound a little bit? I know it's not included in the example that we're currently doing, but can you just because uh, I'm, I'm very confused about the fiduciary assets account and how that works? Yeah, so look, uh, there's a reason why I don't speak about it because it, it's actually not a complex account and it's not something that I've seen come up in exams before, but it, the fiduciary asset account refers to FIDI commissions uh, specifically. And what that is about is, you recall the first person to inherit from a FIDI commission is never became the owner of the asset. It was the second person who became the owner of the asset. But nevertheless, that first person had a holding right towards the asset during his or her lifetime. So when they pass away, I cannot record that asset that they had in their liquidation account because it automatically passes on to the second person. So where I will go and record that asset is in the fiduciary asset account, just to show that, yes, that person did have a holding right towards that particular asset during their lifetime, but they were never the owner thereof. Therefore, we did not include it in the liquidation account. Okay, cool. Thank you. That makes sense. Perfect.
Sorry. Okay. I heard a lady. I just didn't quite uh, hear the name. Sam after. Okay. Go for it. Did we get um, the aqua cam reserved speaker? Sorry, ma'am, I, I couldn't catch you there. It's very soft. Yes, um, the acrylic bang, the acrylic cam received um, figure, um, and was deemed property. The accrual figure, um, yeah. Okay, so that accrual, uh, I assume you're referring to the uh, estate duty account, eh? Yes, yes. And the plus team yes. property. Yes, yes. So uh, accrual is one of two things. It's either deemed property or it is an allowable deduction, okay? Because let's say you pass away and you are married with the accrual system out of community of property. Then they do a calculation to see you know, what spouse owes what spouse money? Let's say the surviving spouse owed the deceased money. Then it would be deemed property. Okay. That, in other words, accrual the deceased estate receives is regarded as deemed property. When it comes to uh, allowable deductions, accrual can also find a home over there. Because perhaps when they did the accrual calculation, it comes to light that the deceased estate owes the surviving spouse money. So any accrual that you give to your surviving spouse will be regarded as an allowable deduction. All right, thank you. Perfect. There, there was another gentleman, yes, Sam, kind of, I think, I believe. Yes, kind. Of. Yes. Um, my question here, Kai, it's, it's, it's a question that I, I, I'm just struggling with. Um, Kai, let's take you have done all your liquid and liabilities, and now you are into distributing everything. It's all right. Your cash supplies to distribute, it's roughly 2.5 million. Eh? And then when you have that amount of money, when you find what is happening within the estate of this person, you find that um, this person has seven kids, three wives, but two of the wives are pre-deceased him and their estate was never dealt with. Do you also distribute to the people who died and their estate were never dealt with or you just ignore them? Now, you would ignore them because remember, if they're predeceased, it would go to their children. And if they had no children, it would just fall back into the estate. Okay. So yeah. if they. Does they that answer you? And the current wife, the current wife who is now surviving, um, does she get 50% of the share or she will have to first share with the other woman that they never shared their 50%? No, no, no. She, she, it will just be the first wife who has a 50% uh, claim for marriage in community of property. Because I assume you're dealing with customary law when you speak of three wives. So no. if it was the first okay. wife, the wife, the they wife would have the 50%. Claim. The wives married him successively, so not at the same time. Yeah. So what uh, wife is the survivor? Is it the first, second, or third one? Okay. First wife died, and then he married second wife. Second wife died, and then the dead, he married the dead wife. He died in his marriage. With uh, the okay, wife. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, so that wife will be entitled to her 50% claim because of the marriage. And then, then uh, if that person died interstate, then you'll follow your interstate rules and divide the remainder between the spouse, that same spouse, as well as the, the, um, uh, the children. Okay, and then, <laughs> okay. since this thing, it's like, okay, let me say, the first wife maybe acquired the property with the husband, 
And when she died, nothing was never dealt with. Well, uh, her estate was never dealt with. And then the title did it still register on both of them. Then how do you deal with that? So what you would need to do is you would need to appoint an executor for that uh, first wife so that, so that that executor could act on behalf of that first wife. And then you could uh, transfer ownership of the property then because you'll need someone to act you know, on that, that wife's behalf because you know, obviously she's not there to sign any documentation for transfer of ownership. So attack that first estate of hers. Get an executorship over, over that estate, and then you can look at transferring property because the executor can then act on her behalf. Okay, Kyle, can I ask Zukisa to share your email with me privately? And I just want to ask you more about this because it's a, it's a case that is going on. And I need That's clarity fine. on it. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, you can speak to her in that regard. All right. Kyle. Go for it, ma'am. Hi, Kyle. I just want to ask you. No, I saw a question the other time when I was doing a previous question paper. The deceased was married in commercial property, and it, when they were listing the assets, they also mentioned that the spouse, surviving spouse, had a vehicle. So that vehicle was included. So every time it's in commuter property and the other spouse, surviving spouse, has something, must we also include it in the liquidation account? 100%, ma'am. And, and, and the reason there too is because if you're married in community or property, you only have one estate, eh? you and your spouse. Yes. So if, they, mm -hmm. if you were in community of property and they said your spouse had a vehicle, you would have to include it in your estate as well. Because if she has a vehicle, it means you have a vehicle, if that makes sense. And if she has like debts, must we also include those debts also? Correct. Uh, assets and liabilities are shared equally for marriages yes. in community of property. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Pleasure. I'm due. We so may I proceed, sir. Oh. Uh, Kyle, I just wanted to ask about, about the rebate of the 3.5 uh, million. Um, how did we get to to that? Because I saw also in the book they say it's 7 million, and, and so I just couldn't ask. Rebate. Thank you. Okay. So, so, so if you saw uh, a 7 million, that's because they're just speaking about uh, two spouses uh, that are married. But the rebate is automatically three and a half million for each individual person. Um, there's no there's no calculation we got to get there. It is just standard legislation. You know, that three and a half million will only change when the law changes. So you will just automatically put your three and a half million down. Uh, so does this three million does not mean the total estate must be above three million then? No, no, it doesn't mean that. Um, if if it's less than, if the total estate was less than than, than that amount, then it just means we're not going to pay any estate duty, you know. Oh, okay, no, I get it now. So if the amount is less than three point five million, we then don't calculate the twenty percent of the estate duty. Yeah, look, still do it for the exam. Still finish your calculation because you don't know how they're going to mark you. But you will will already know that we're going to have a null balance. Oh, noted with thanks. Perfect. Naira here. Naira, I'm listening. Okay. Um, where the deceased has two spouses, uh, like two wives, one um that's a registered marriage and the other is a customary. If the registered marriage is um, out of community of property, um, then do we assume the customary marriage is uh, marriage in community of property? So do you know of a scenario like this? Um, I, I've been looking at past papers. I haven't attempted it. I was just looking at how the layout was. Um, but yeah, um, I, they, they don't really state. They just say one is a marriage and they have a customary wife. 
Yeah, so, so, you know, generally the rule is when you're married, according to normal South African rules, you can't take another marriage. Um, that's the general rules. But if they pose the scenario to you that you had a registered South African marriage and you had a customary law marriage and the registered one was out of community of property, then I would assume the customary law marriage could have been in community of property. Um, the reality is you can't have more than one in community of property marriage. Um, so the fact that the, the other one was out would, would mean that you could have an in community of property uh, marriage. Um, but yeah, on, on the basis of it, my only concern is that, you know, I'll have to look at it myself because I haven't dealt with a scenario like that in practice. But um, generally, you know, if you've got a registered marriage in terms of the normal matrimonial law, you're not allowed to take another marriage, you know. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I would assume I would assume that you could have an in community of property customary law marriage. Then. Okay, thank you. Ooh. As Primrose Kite. I'm listening, ma'am. Yes, good evening. I, I would like to ask if um like uh, maybe the couples they were they were married in community of property and then they divorced but you know you have to um maybe there was a house involved and then you have you had to sell the house or buy out the other spouse but at a, you know you you are not in a position to sell the house Nora do you buy out the spouse and one of the spouse dies, what happens? Okay, so, so remember that house then would be would have been co-owned then because there's no longer a marriage. So it means that the one who died, that half value of that property would then put would be put in that person's liquidation account. So th there's no longer a division because of marriage, but there's a division in the property because of co-ownership. So you in that deceased estate would only have put half of the value of that property under your liquidation account. And, and, and to take it further, to take it further, in such a scenario, if the one can't buy the other one out, then the property would ultimately need to be sold. Okay, so this in community of property in the rich, eh? It follows you to death, yeah? Yeah, well, <laughs> um, I've encountered many clientele who have said the exact same thing. So I suppose it's from person to person, eh? <laughs> Ladies and gents, I will take a maximum of three more questions this evening. So if you have anything, you can say your name. Maina. Maina, I'm listening. Um, Kyle, I just want to ask if you managed to uh, get some clarity on what I asked yesterday, because you said you're going to find out if um, the, the question that I asked about the polygamous marriage, whereby a guy is getting married to two women at the same time. Oh, Maina, I, I completely forgot. Sorry, I, I ran a case today and I came back to the office and consulted with two different clients, came back home to do this. I got you at about, about 5.25. I, it completely slipped my mind. Um, I do remember you now that you mention it. Okay, let, let me sort it out for you afterwards, all right? I'll, I'll email uh, Zukiswa on it and okay. uh, get it to forward it to you, all right? Uh, okay, no problems. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. Ladies and gents, we seem to not have any more questions. Okay, so so what I want to say in, in terms of what we've dealt with these four days, okay, now it is obviously incredibly difficult, number one, to teach someone an L&D account over the course of a couple of days. An L&D account is something that we'd need a semester on in, in theory, all right? 
Number two, we obviously do not have the privilege of you sitting in front of me and me having a board and me going through with it. So it does have its own challenges. But we do sit with our notes. We do sit with the recordings. So the aim at this stage would be to understand what every account, or let me rather say to understand the purpose of every account and to be able to, from a basic um, perspective, be able to draft the, a basic l &D. Now, ladies and gents, there is more to it. And there's a reason why we don't speak of more to it, because if I had to go into complete depth with this l and I would lose 90% of you if you did not do l and in varsity or alternatively you have not done l and in reality. So what I'm coming to is what I would suggest is I would suggest you look at your notes, you study them, you make sure you understand it. Once you have this basic understanding, you then open your book up and advance your knowledge on the law. Because I obviously do not know if what we did over the course of the four days is enough for you to pass your exam. And nevertheless, you are not here to just study your notes, you're here to study your book. But what I hope we have achieved is that when you go and open your book now and go through your test state, in test state, and your l and account and so forth, you don't go through it blindsided. You go through with the ability to actually interpret what you are reading in your books. If you are able to do that, then the four days we spent together was a success because you are now in a position where you can understand and interpret all the different aspects of your l and So in that fashion, I hope I was of assistance uh, to all of you. But on that note, um, ladies and gents, it was awesome uh, being with all of you for these four evenings. I mean, we had roughly at certain stages just 270 odd people on the line and we managed to get through what we needed to get through in these four days, which is sometimes a challenge considering, you know, you never quite know if everyone's fully understanding. And there's obviously a number of questions from a number of different people. So I think we, we got through it quite nicely. Please, if you miss things or perhaps um, we were too fast on certain situations, please make sure you get your hands on the recordings. Um, listen to it again, get your understanding and then go and open that book and advance your knowledge um, thereon. All right. From my side, ladies and gents, it was a pleasure meeting you all, and I'm sure I'll come across you in practice. Um, best of luck going forward with your exams. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle.